In this video, we'll attempt to answer this question here. What causes personality? That is, why are we the way that we are? And we'll investigate several different perspectives that look at the role, relatively speaking, that genetics versus our environments, our nature and our nurture, play in determining our personality. So I want to start with this question here. What do you think has the biggest impact on a person's personality? What do you think has had the biggest impact on your personality? And I'll give you a few options. A, how about some genes, right? Your genetics. B, ways that you think about the world, optimism, pessimism, how you interpret your environment. C, your environment itself, environmental influences. D, sort of your motivation, your innate drive to achieve your potential. Does that impact your personality? Or E, your childhood experiences. Well, regardless of what you said, how you responded, there is a theory in psychology out there, or a perspective, I should say, that corresponds to each of these different answers. We're going to talk about just a couple of them today, starting with genes, behavior genetics. Now, we have learned in the past uh, about these behavior genetic designs, specifically in the heritability and how psychologists assess nature versus nurture video that I had a while back. And I want to start with this, just to reiterate and remind you of that, this distinction between monozygotic and dizygotic twins, MZ and DZ. So monozygotic twins, which are also called identical twins, share 100% of their genetic material. Dizygotic twins, in contrast, share 50% of their genetic material. And this is really useful, this difference for understanding and for measuring and assessing genetic differences in anything, really. The idea is this, if monozygotic twins are more similar to each other, in personality in this case, than dizygotic twins, this suggests that personality is influenced by genetic composition. And if monozygotic twins reared apart, raised separately, are more similar in terms of their personalities than dizygotic twins reared apart, then again, more of a genetic influence. Now, trying to estimate the extent to which genetic influences uh, personality influences personality can be a challenge, in part because there are several sources of similarity between twin pairs. Twins share genetics, yes, but they also share their environment. For example, they might have the same people raising them, they might live in the same house, and they might go to the same school. So how can we disentangle the genetic influences on personality from the effects of having a shared environment? Well, as I kind of just hinted at, we can look to twins with non-shared environments, that is, environments that are unique to each individual. For example, twins reared apart from one another. In addition to looking at those reared together, that is, those with a shared environment. So let's look at the results from a classic study, a classic behavior genetic study that did just that. Now there's a lot of data here, so I'm going to try and walk you through it, and I'll kind of draw this uh, on the screen at the same time to help. First, let's focus on this uh, column here. This is a bunch of different things that they measured, aspects of the twins' uh, personality. We are also looking here at twins that were reared together and twins that were reared apart. And for each of these, twins reared together and apart, we're looking at identical, fraternal, identical, fraternal. So lots of really rich data. Now what you're seeing in the column itself, in all of these columns itself, are correlations in terms of identical twins and fraternal twins. To what extent do the twins match up with one another along these personality dimensions? If one twin is aggressive, is it likely the case that the other is aggressive, or is there not really a correlation here? Now I'm going to highlight a couple of things. First of all, let's look at twins reared together right over here. That's a terrible, there we go. Twins reared together. So look at these correlations. These are pretty strong positive correlations, which is to say that identical twins who are reared together tend to be pretty similar in their personalities. Now notice, look at these fraternal twin correlations. They're still positive, but they're significantly less. That is to say, the correlation between the personalities of identical twins who are raised together is significantly greater than the correlation for personalities and different personality characteristics and traits for fraternal tw twins who are raised together. Now let's take a look at the twins raised apart. You're going to see a very similar kind of trend. So again, 
identical twin correlations significantly higher than the fraternal twin correlations. And this is important, right? Because what we're seeing is the greater extent to which you share genetic material, the more similar your personalities are to one another. And in contrast, the environment is playing a relatively small role. For example, let's compare these two groups of data points here. So in both cases, they're identical twins, right? But in one case, they're reared together, and in the other, they're reared apart. Notice that the correlations are, are strong. They're high in both cases. And so again, it seems to be that genetics are playing a really strong component here, a really strong uh, piece of the puzzle we're seeing, whereas the environment uh, is definitely influencing, but not as much. And I do want to pause to say I'm kind of arguing for a genetic explanation for personality here, but these correlations do not equal one. These are not positive, uh, perfectly positive correlations. There is still some uh, room for error here, which means there are other factors that are influencing personality. And if it's not genetics, it probably is environment, right? Now let's uh, kind of define what we're looking at here. This, this idea that we're seeing is called biological determinism. We look at these data and the belief is, well, maybe personality traits are inborn. We call that belief biological determinism. Now, scholars who ascribe instead to social, behavioral, and learning approaches to understanding personality reject biological determinism. Strict behaviorists, for example, such as B.F. Skinner, believe that personality is influenced solely by the environment, so the entire opposite end of the spectrum, through processes such as operant conditioning uh, that shape our behavior over time. So in contrast, is the social cognitive theory of personality, which takes that a little bit of a step further, championed by people like Albert Bandura. And this social cognitive theory of personality posits that both learning, which is the focus of behaviorists, as I just said, as well as cognitive factors, which is kind of a new idea, are sources of individual differences in personality. This approach starts with the assumption that personality is shaped primarily by the environment and by how we interpret our environment. So the key idea is that how we interpret our environment affects how we react to it. And the result is what we refer to as reciprocal determinism. So the idea here is that behavior as well as thought, which together make up a person's personality, both influence and are influenced by the social environment. So just to reiterate, the idea is that all of these factors influence each other, which is why we call it reciprocal determinism. So what are some examples of some of these factors? Well, an example of a behavioral factor is observational learning, which is a vicarious form of learning that is driven by observing someone else's behavior and the consequences of that behavior. So Bandura and other social cognitive theorists believe that observational learning plays a role in forming personality in that we develop behavior patterns based on the observation of others. As an example of a cognitive factor, we have self-efficacy, the level of confidence that we have in our own abilities. Self-efficacy is influenced by our social experiences, for example, by the feedback you get from other people, and it, again, affects us. It affects our personality. In this case, it probably affects how you would approach future challenges. Now, we can't end our discussion of personality without talking at least a little bit about our old friend, Sigmund Freud. Freud believed that personality develops as a result of internal, both conscious and unconscious, forces that wage war between us. And he illustrated these ideas by comparing the mind to an iceberg. A small part of the mind is conscious, right, above the surface, visible, whereas the majority of it lives beneath the surface in what he called the unconscious. And this is where we get the term Freudian slip, if you've heard that before a slip of the tongue in which we say something we didn't intend to, presumably because what was said is associated with some thought or urge lingering in the unconscious. As Freud might say, a Freudian slip is when you say one thing, but you mean your mother. I mean another. According to Freud, our personality develops from a conflict, a conflict between our desires for immediate gratification, which Freud called the id, and our understanding of social norms and morality that suppresses these drives, what Freud called our superego. Now, Freud argued that personality arises out of our efforts to find balance in this conflict, which is mediated 
by what Freud called our ego. And the ego helps satisfy our desires in a rational way. So it operates on what we call the rational principle. If the id says, I want this now, and the superego says, no, it's not right to do that, it's not okay to do that, then the ego would say, well, maybe we can find a compromise 